Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the webcast, How to Ensure Your Performance and Compensation Review Strategies Are Aligned, sponsored by CRG and Perform. This webcast has been pre-approved for HRCI and SHRM credit. Please be sure to attend the complete webcast in order to receive your credits. You will receive an email from hr.com within two business days. It will include the certification credit information. You may also log in to hr.com and go to your View My Credits page where you can see the credits that you have received. If you have questions during the webcast, click on Q&A in your webinar controls and type them in. Also, a new tab will open in your browser with the webcast survey. Please make sure to complete it as soon as the webcast has ended. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to our presenter, John Smith. Thanks very much, Kathy, and thank you everyone for joining us today for this webinar on performance and compensation alignment. Uh, just before we get started, a couple of key things. Uh, for your reference, we have slides and reference materials available on our website. Uh, that uh, URL is in front of you, and I think it's presented later on in the presentation as well. So if you don't get a chance to take it now, you can take it later. I think the slides are also available uh, through the uh, Zoom platform if you want to download them. But just a bit about me before we get started, uh, I have worked in this area for the last 15 years, helping organizations automate and improve uh, performance and compensation and merit review processes. So I've been involved in all kinds of them. Uh, I have uh, a CPA designation, so I come today with my finance hat half on. And, you know, sometimes I sit back and think about the value of compensation dollars that we've adjusted over the years, and it's got to be upwards in the billions. Sometimes I look at it at the end of the process. We did one last week and we adjusted a $50 million salary base uh, as part of that compensation review process. And I think, gee, we should have added up all the way along the value of these dollars. So I come at this today with some experience and I'm gonna share with you what I see out there. I've learned a lot from our clients, and continue to learn a lot from our clients as we go through this process. And hopefully along the way uh, today, we'll give you some tips and tricks and things that uh, will help add value internally at your organization. We know things are changing out there, and certainly the world of human capital management is changing quite a bit. We see it every day in the world of performance management and organizations shaking up their processes and trying to deal with it. And for us, compensation is always seems to be tied and is always a desired outcome. Uh, so this area today involves some big topics. We talk a little bit today about performance management. We talk about compensation strategy and management. And I just want to say before we get into these topics that they're huge topics and some of these some of the pieces that we talk about could probably be webinars on their own so um, there's no way to address everything but we'll do our best uh, to take you through some content uh, and again hopefully this will give you some food for thought so just in terms of agenda what we're going to go over today we're going to look at what a year-end compensation review process should look like uh, we're going to talk about common challenges related to merit reviews uh, factors to consider when building a compensation strategy and how to ensure, of course, the topic of performance and compensation are aligned. Uh, we talk about key factors and effective pay for performance design. Now, we want to talk a little bit about the process here. And, and you know, I think one of the ones that I, I think is, is really valuable is around calibration and, and timing. So uh, we'll spend a bit of time on those as well uh, as we go through this. So let's start with the end game, what a year-end compensation review should look like, or in our world, what it does look like in a lot of cases. And I put up on the screen here a grid, and you know this is from our technology platform, but suffice to say there's lots of pieces of information in here that are really useful. We start with you know, grouping up employees, so their managers uh, and supervisors who's ever involved in the process have a view of their direct reports. You know, Of course, there's some alignment here with performance measures that we bring in. Uh, we talk about, you know, market benchmarks and tangibly seeing that through sort of midpoint and comp ratio. We bring in accurate uh, salary data. Uh, oftentimes, our clients and organizations have recommended increases that are based on performance and where the employee sits relative uh, to midpoint or, or factors in the comp ratio. And then the important part is giving managers some discretion here to follow the guideline or adjust it as they need uh, for their team. Oftentimes, there's a budget pool component that's brought into it, and you know that again is a further guideline. There's an administrative calculation that's done for proration, 
and of course it gets routed for approval. So, wow, lots of good stuff there. Boy, wouldn't this be nice if every organization could make a compensation review that simple and get to this point. But the challenge, of course, is getting here. Uh, the challenge is reaching the destination and, and bringing it together in a process that uh, is understood by organizational stakeholders and, of course, that aligns again with performance. And that's really the topic we want to get to today. You know, oftentimes as an output, we see nice consolidation grids. Uh, that pop out at the click of a button and, you know, this process runs over three to four weeks and the output's automatically integrated back to the payroll system and the employee receives a compensation statement at the end that, hey, you know, discusses their performance and, you know, outlines their compensation adjustments for the coming period and the, the effective date. So, how do we get there? Well, there are some common challenges we should take a look at. And, uh, let's talk about these for a second. The three P's, purpose, people, and process. And we know, of course, that the annual compensation review process can be tedious, time-consuming, and expensive, so it's important to get it right. Uh, many times HR departments are stressed to gather competitive data, competitive market data. We have managers doing performance discussions with direct reports. Calibrations are being held held uh, Excel workbooks are flying around through emails. Managers are making cases for changes outside the norm. We know salary budgets are squeezed and tough decisions are made and managers communicate the final results. And all this effort uh, rarely leaves anybody feeling elated with the outcome. Um, and oftentimes we find and clients tell us that the outcome doesn't align with the expectation going into it. So we've got to stand back and look at this a little bit. We've got to think about these three Ps as we go through it, but I want to just touch on one other thing, the role of spreadsheets. And more often than not, when we talk to HR folks that are out there and we talk about the compensation merit review process, the spreadsheet component is something that they're trying to get rid of. We all know Excel is great, but lots of risk throwing you know, confidential data around an email uh, let alone have it in Excel spreadsheets that are subject to error and have formula error, you know, that require lots of data dumping and manipulation of data to feed the spreadsheet, um, you know, spending, you know, non-value added time consolidating all of this, you know, and, and really, you know, not having a handle on where things are as, as we go through the process. So oftentimes this becomes a big process bottleneck. We also know We've got some environmental factors out there, some things happening in the world that, you know, influence how we do this. And, you know, uh, right now we're definitely seeing a shift uh, from sort of uh, one sort of combined process to separate but aligned processes. And I think this is an important slide as well. You know, uh, we saw a Towers Watson survey we read recently that said, one out of five employees say their company's merit pay is effective in driving performance. We know modern companies are more collaborative and transparent. Um, you know, things that were grouped together like reviews, goals, development planning, compensation are now being treated as separate but aligned. And so seeking alignment, extremely important. If we want to improve this process, really if we want to improve alignment, what's required? And I think the first three bullets are sort of hardcore requirements. The fourth one is an optional debt, a bonus, but optional. But first, we've got to start with a well-developed compensation strategy that's completely and totally transparent. Next, we've got to deal with a reliable individual and institutional performance management process. And I think this third step is key for alignment, which is a calibration process to finalize performance. And this needs to happen before compensation review. So we want to talk about these three bullets in a little bit more detail. Again, probably each one of them is its own webinar, uh, but we'll talk briefly about them just to see, you know, how this comes together. As we go through it, you can think about your own, or your own organization and the processes you have in place and whether they, you know, whether they fit into this paradigm or not. So we'll start with compensation strategy, and I start here with a slide and, and really when I stand back and look at the work we do with our clients and you know what I learned from them and what, what they tell us when they talk about compensation strategy is they always talk about three pillars. 
they may not call it three pillars, but there's always three pillars in play. Internal equity, market equity, and performance. And of those three pillars, I'd say majority have a performance element, but some today do not. Depending on the nature of their organization or the industry they're in, there may not be a performance component. Uh, we're going to assume for the balance of this presentation that there is a performance component involved in this. And, you know, that's oftentimes where the struggle is. That's oftentimes where the challenge is. So let's step back and look at these three just a little bit in a little bit more detail. If we start with internal equity, let's think about this. We know employees, as they think about things, assess the fairness of their own pay compared to others. We know that uh, employees observe other employees in the same job and mentally determine, you know, the contribution their peers are making and, you know, hey, I wonder what they get paid and is it fair? Uh, we know employees also observe people in different jobs and make judgments about those jobs and, you know, again, ask, is it fair compared to how they're being paid? So when we think about internal equity, we think about the important elements of job evaluation, parity between jobs, and parity between individuals in the same job. When we think about market equity, of course, we're talking about our positions in our organization and how they stack up inside our market, both local um, and within the same industry. And so oftentimes we're caught doing, uh, you know, salary surveys and gathering market data uh, so that we understand the, the market equity component. For us, we see the market equity element hitting merit and compensation review very much in terms of compa ratio. Uh, there's a huge interest in it. It's used by a lot of HR departments. Of course, compa ratio is somebody's base salary, uh, you know, versus the midpoint for the position that they're in. And so tangibly, one of the pieces of data we oftentimes are dealing with is, is midpoint um, so that we can calculate compa ratio uh, and give us a bit of a guide as to, as to where the individual sits. Performance is also something that has become very, uh, very much an important part of a compensation strategy. And, and of course, we hear pay for performance everywhere. Um, and of course, it's a good strategy. People and organizations are using it to attract, retain, and motivate employees. But I think this one is where we need to step back a little bit and dive down a little bit deeper. Because, you know, if we're going to dive into pay for performance, there's some key considerations that are being made. And let's talk about these for a minute. First, are we ready for pay for performance as an organization? Is the culture going to support it? Is management committed to changing the culture? If not, what are the goals of pay for performance? Is it to improve recruitment and retention, increase individual and organizational performance, greater fairness and pay, probably all of the above? Who should be paid for performance? You know, there's an important question. Is it is pay for performance program eligible for everyone? Is it just top level managers? That's an important consideration. What should be the timing for implementing the pay for performance? Should it be done across the board at the same time for everyone? If we're introducing a strategy like this, uh, should it be done in stages? What should be rewarded? There's a key question that a lot of organizations struggle with. Is it individual team and organizational achievements? Does it bring in metrics? How many metrics? Uh, is it short-term and long-term goals? Is it effort and outcome? What exactly is the basis of reward? How should employees be rewarded? Is this a one-time cash bonus, for instance? Is it an increase to base pay? Is it a combination? And certainly in our organizations that we work with, we're seeing a lot of the combination factor in there uh, that seem to be coming through. And how much of the pay, as a percentage of pay, how much should be contingent on performance? Should it be 25%, 10%, up to 10%? Uh, again, those are important questions that need to be asked. And, of course, what's the impact on the annual budget and financial considerations? So, of course, that's going to mean working with finance and, of course, getting it pre-approved. And as we'll talk about later in the presentation, that really brings up the importance of uh, of, of alignment and of calibration so that we can have those discussions um, and feel confident when we're having them that we've got the right data. So we're going to circle back to that point number eight as we, as we continue through the presentation today. So when I look at this, I said, well, you know, it'd be interesting to look at how organizations 
are actually making compensation changes. In other words, what's the drivers of compensation changes? Um, and so before we look at that, we had to say, well, you know, if we're looking at performance programs, they really, and I found this on, a, on an article I was reading, was really interesting and I think true that there's, there's one more key decision, which is maybe it's the first decision. Is this sort of poor performance going to be based on a formal goal attainment plan where we're defining hard goals and objectives with thresholds and target? Um, or is it more discretionary in nature in that there's no defined relationship between a level of performance and the payout? And so, Again, just another important consideration. So those, that, this slide and the last two, I think, you, we need to know the answers to those if we're going to implement a pay-for-performance program. If you have a pay-for-performance program in place, you probably already know those answers. Here's what's interesting. I found this survey done by Mercer. Uh, it was done in 2017. It was a 2017-2018 survey. And what it talked about was the performance drivers and non-performance drivers of compensation. And they did a survey of a thousand or more companies, and, and this is what basically came back. Uh, base salary increases were primarily rewarded based on individual performance to some degree, to a lesser degree company performance. And base salary increases, the most often they're in, they're, they occur with non-performance drivers would be for internal equity adjustments. So, we sit back and look at it, and really, if you listen to that survey, and I would say it's true of what we see with our clients over the last 15 years, base salary are being adjusted for individual performance and internal equity adjustments, and of course, you know, that brings in promotion, et cetera. Short-term incentives and bonuses, largely based on company performance for executive management and individual performance for lower-level employees and non-performance drivers for short-term incentive and bonus would be things like individual development, growth, competencies, et cetera. And then SPA bonuses, which have become another part of the compensation equation, largely based on performance drivers, and usually here individual performance or team performance. So it was interesting to me to look back at this because there's so many ways to twist this around, but we always, as I said at the beginning, we always see this relationship between performance review, performance assessment, individual performance, and compensation. And it seems like those two processes are tied together. There's lots of literature out there that says they shouldn't be, that they should be separate. And there's lots of companies trying programs to separate them. But it seems like they're implicitly linked for one reason or another. So it becomes really clear to us that performance review needs to support compensation strategy. And so if we're talking about this, it means we sort of have to deal with the performance review process. And for many organizations, that's a struggle. Uh, I can tell you, again, just, just based on the space we're in and the number of organizations we speak to, uh, you know, there's a, there's a whole thought that automating a performance review process would improve it. But, you know, that's not really what it's about. What it's about is changing the process uh, to encourage you know, more, more frequent feedback to, you know, bring more voices into the process to stop it being this once a year process and to start it being a performance process that's top of mind with employees. For a lot of organizations, it's, a, it's sort of a, a big black cloud that they don't want to touch. Uh, they don't want to go into it. It's scary. It's a change that's going to impact everyone. So I want to talk a little bit about this performance review process because to me, it's an enabler. To me, it's a very important first part of aligning performance and comp. And of course, as we've said, uh, you know, uh, modern performance management is moving to frequent performance assessments, often conducted project by project, and the focus is on delivering more immediate feedback uh, so that individuals and teams can course correct. And you know, this is a great, uh, a great article that's a recent article called The New Rules of Talents Management, uh, specifically HR Goes Agile in Harvard Business Review. Encourage you to take a look at it. There's lots of good information in there. And it sort of lines up with what we're talking about today with the alignment of performance and comp. So inside here, when we think about this, this performance strategy, we, we did a, a webinar last year for HR.com. It was called Reviving the Performance Review. And the reviving webinar goes through 
sort of how do we revive this process? What are the key factors out there in performance management? But more importantly, it talks about how can my organization implement an effective process or what should my organization implement? So if you have an opportunity, you know, go back and, and watch that webinar. Um, certainly, I think you'd, you'd, you'd get some value out of that just from a point of view of, of, you know, process considerations and content. But there's also some polls in there that we do with the audience that, you know, give you a flavor to where other organizations are at. And, you know, in there, I just, you know, I talk about a little bit about three companies. And these are three companies that I follow very closely uh, on a performance management side. And I follow them closely because these three companies have made huge changes to their performance management processes over the last, uh, you know, three years or so. Um, certainly there are other big, uh, well-known brand companies that have made changes to their performance process. But GE, Adobe, and Deloitte are three that I like to look at because they've made fundamental changes that affect a large group of employees. And the changes that they've made to their performance processes are all different. And, uh, and there's interesting things that each of them are doing, and there's, of course, stuff we can learn from them. So let's just talk briefly about these. General Electric, uh, which was known for many, many years to have a very formal, structured performance process. It was rigid. It was known as a rank and yank system uh, because they always terminated the bottom 10% uh, following that performance review. They've made radical changes to their process, and we ask why, and the reasons are that they say, well, the world doesn't work on an annual basis anymore, and more importantly, millennials want frequent, fast, mobile-enabled feedback. GE is also a very highly matrixed environment. Uh, work one employee does is closely connected uh, with other employees. Relationships change, and they don't change on an annual schedule. Um, so the system for goal setting and feedback needed to be more flexible. So what do they do? They developed an internal app. It's a feedback app. It's called PD at GE, which is an acronym for performance development at GE. And each employee goes into this app and sets goals and objectives, and they can ask for insights from other people. So interesting. That's number one. Number two, Adobe, another interesting one. Adobe redesigned their entire process, and they got away from again, a very formal process, and went to one that is based on, uh, based on quarterly check-ins. So the idea here is that managers and employees meet for check-in discussions at least once a quarter. And the discussion covers three topics we'll call expectations, feedback, and growth and development. And actually, as an outcome, if that was something you're interested in, Adobe's published their, uh, they published their new performance review process on their website. You can actually download their process. There's some guidebooks on how they do it, uh, strategies and tips as you go through this quarterly process. So if you're thinking about retooling performance with a quarterly review process, even though you may not follow Adobe's process, I'll tell you it's a very good resource. They're so proud of it. They publish it out there for anybody to look at. So just Google it and you'll, you'll get it. The big thing about Adobe, there's no longer ratings. And this, is, this is, gets interesting because if there's no ratings, how do we award merit? And their merit process now is based on a manager being given a budget, educating them on how the, the ranges for their positions work, and uh, you know, letting them make decisions about awarding merit. There is no matrix or formal guidelines by employee. So each budget manager, each person responsible for uh, recommendations uh, you know, for merit increases is held accountable for their budget. And that's the process running inside Adobe. So again, another one to look at. And lastly, and again, different, you know, again, different is Deloitte. And Deloitte went from, a, as a professional services organization, as many of you know, and they've gone from sort of cascading objectives, numeric rankings, 360 reviews, to four simple questions that they ask uh, that they ask the managers to weigh in on. And, and I'm going to come back to those four questions in a minute. So we look at those three, we say, you know what, we've got three big organizations, three totally different, you know, approaches to performance management. And I'll tell you, that's created a lot of confusion in the marketplace because there is really no right way to do performance management. 
And as we just said, that's a problem because we got to figure this piece out. If we're going to align performance and comp, boy, oh boy, we need to know what we're doing. We need to have people believe in the process that we're running. So all of this comes out to what we would say in our experience and, you know, what we've seen from the presentations on reviving have told us is that you know, there's really three types of performance reviews out there. You can bundle all these up as many ways as you like. You can read as many articles as you want. My take, and this is John's take, is that there's only three. Uh, you're in classic mode, which is, you know, traditional ratings and subject areas, and we meet once a year, maybe we do a mid-year, and we look at goals and competencies. Some look at company values and learning and development. We look at the modern approach, and the modern approach is sort of taking the classic approach and bringing in some of what we'll call the radical stuff. So modern says, yeah, we do that stuff, but we also bring in quarterly check-ins and accomplishments and continuous feedback elements. So you know, we get a bit of blend of, of sort of looking backward at ratings and looking backward at behavior. We put some ratings around it, but we also bring in coaching. We bring in mentoring through quarterly, minimum quarterly conversations, but continuous feedback as well. And then there's the radical camp. And the radical camp is where I'd actually put General Electric and Deloitte for sure. Maybe Adobe straddles modern and radical, but since Adobe doesn't have an annual check-in process, I'd say they're still in the radical camp as well. The funny thing is we've done this presentation for, you know, a number of, I've done this presentation at a number of SHRM events, and of course we did it on HR.com, and you can watch that, and the poll's in there. And here's what comes back. The organizations that we poll say, you know what, the vast majority of them are trying to implement what's defined, we define as a modern process. So they're taking the best of the old with the best of the new and combining it. That raises a question about radical. Why is it not more adopted? Well, I think we know that, that radical is not more adopted because if we're going to build a compensation strategy, we got to figure out how to build one around, uh, around one that has no ratings and no annual true up. And for those of you wondering what the annual true up comment is, I apologize for that. That's my finance hat. Uh, the annual true up means that if we implement a performance review process, that is solely based on continuous feedback elements, even quarterly objectives and quarterly assessment that just go on and on and on. What happens if there's no point in time where it all comes together? What happens if it's just in a continuing process, but once a year we don't step back and say, I'm going to put a rating on this employee or, you know, I'm going to give a formal performance assessment, you know, in a traditional process, we'd say we do performance reviews so that they close out at the end of the year. But if the performance review is continuing, is completely ongoing, there's never this annual stop, this annual true up that we call it. And so radical becomes a bit problematic because radical doesn't give us a rating on the employee can't run a report in a radical scenario and say, where's the employee list of, of ratings? How do people rank? Who sort of, you know, are daily contributors doing a great job every day? Who are our high performance, high potential employees? Who are employees at risk of low performance? I'd have to go talk to all the managers because I, I, I don't have something to rely on. I don't have a report. I don't have a numeric ranking. I can't build a recommended compensation increase out of that necessarily, um, I'd have to really put a lot of thought into it and it's not tangible. So, you know, when we think about it, we think the performance review process is, is, is dominated by change now in two ways. One is dealing with continuous feedback, which we know millennials, and frankly, it's not just millennials, everybody wants to know how they're doing. And the other thing we have to deal with is ratings, and the ratings is the other area in performance that cause confusion. You've certainly read articles and know of companies, I'm sure, uh, that are doing away with ratings in their performance review process. I mean, some of them are getting rid of performance altogether, but if you know, we've got lots that are trying the latest fad, which is to drop the ratings. And so we thought, you know, just before we close out this performance conversation, let's talk a little bit about ratings. And ratings are important. They're important in the context, obviously, of compensation because it relates to formal measurement. Uh, and obviously, the measurement piece is important. Uh, 
you know, we did do uh, as a piece of content again, um, and it's on that employee-performance.com align webinar uh, URL. We put our rating scale guidebook up there. It's been really well received by people that have looked at it. Lots of ideas in there uh, for effective rating scales. And in the context of today's conversation, let's think of those as measurement and how those are going to drive compensation changes, which again, we're going to come to very shortly. So we know, we know ratings are uh, an area of considerable uh, conversation nowadays when we think about performance. I think uh, I've sat in on many design sessions at our client sites. I have had people argue about three levels of rating for four hours. Uh, I, I'm stunned actually. I came back to the office completely stunned that senior management at a client we were at spent four hours talking about overall rating scale, the wording that was used in three levels, and whether three levels should be four levels. Some advocated five, and this conversation went on for about four hours. And so we said, you know, this is causing a lot of confusion out there. We know rating scales cause confusion. First, they're confusing to employees and managers. Uh, oftentimes, bias drives the rating instead of facts. Employees tend to, uh, to feel that they're not being treated fairly, that the ratings aren't necessarily accurate. I mean, we've heard employees that say, well, I got an average of three and a half out of five, on my overall rating. So that put me in a meets expectations category. But here's the thing. When I went through college and university, I was an A team member and I specifically don't believe I'm a 70% candidate, I'm a 90. Uh, we know they can paint inaccurate pictures of performance in the organization. You know, they, they don't always help identifying high and low uh, performers. They inhibit the manager's ability to gauge progress. And of course, everybody, can lose trust in the process as it relates to rewards and promotions. So lots of side effects here. No ratings, as we talked about, big movement there, good in theory, but what we're finding and what the research is showing is something that you know, we refer to as shadow or ghost ratings. So the organization getting rid of formal ratings, then what's happening is the management team's meeting in a room and sort of behind closed doors, they're applying ratings and they're using those ratings for reward and performance discussion. And so that becomes pr potentially problematic. I'm sure uh, employees would uh, prefer to have a different scenario. I guess one positive from it would be that there's calibration taking place because people are getting together and doing it. But, you know, there's lots of cautions around these shadows or ghost ratings. And we're finding that you know, there's research out there showing that organizations have moved from the no rating process, actually moved back to it uh, because it's not being well received. So what does that mean for us? Well, it means we got to look at rating scales and give some best practices here to close out performance. We want to assume uh, that rating scales fit the content being rated. And I think, you know, that's probably our number one thing that we, that we always look at, uh, that they're tied to the content that they're measuring. Um, but they got to be clear and easy to interpret. They can't distract. They should be simple enough that people understand them. Uh, we think text-based rating scales are better received than numbers. Human beings seem to react to text better, better than numbers. It's better in the example I told you that somebody is told their meets expectations than being told you're 3.5 out of 5. Uh, ratings from multiple sources should be factored in. That's obviously a growing trend. We've got self-assessments. We've got peer and 360 review happening. Um, ratings should be dynamic, they can change, they should be calibrated, we're going to talk about that in a minute, and employees should understand, important part, that number 10, how those ratings relate to rewards, how they relate to compensation changes, merit, bonus, whatever it is, how does the rating impact the comp process? So some examples of rating scales that we found very effective, when we look at goals, and, you know, all of these processes that we see out there in performance management, no matter what you read, I can pretty much guarantee you they're going to have a big goals and objectives part. GE, Adobe, Deloitte, they all are very focused on goals still. So what do we do with goals? Well, let's talk about how goals are measured. And, you know, I think the, the first one is my favorite personally is it's where is it? Is it deferred? Is it met? Is it partially met? Is it not met? Is it in progress? Where is it? Uh, the second one, you know, brings in some percentage factors. And the third one's cute as well. Um, you know, destination reached, chugging along and right on track, uh, derailed, let's talk, and haven't left the station yet. So 
Again, easy to understand if the goal is structured properly, the rating scale matches the goal. If we look at competencies, you know, one of my favorites has always been the first set here uh, that talks about consistently observed, observed, sometimes observed, and seldom observed. And in this scenario, I just want to mention with that one, that's actually an adaptation of Dick Groth's uh, behavior frequency scale. And when I first started in this performance management area, I think I read this article from Dick Groth probably like 18 years ago. And he was advocating that the best way uh, to assess competencies and behaviors is to use this behavior frequency scale. Um, so we've often recommended that to clients, but there's also other ones. You can you know, rate competencies in terms of proficiency level and, and a strength or, or improving and competent, et cetera, developing. So that's another way to gauge measurement. And then we come back to Deloitte's four questions. So this is always an area of interest as well. Given what I know of this person's performance, here's question one, given what I know of this person's performance and if it were my money, would I award this person the highest possible compensation increase and bonus? And so what you can do here is give your, as a manager, you give your feedback and you use a strongly agree to strongly disagree scale. Remember, there's four questions. Question two, given what I know of this person's performance, would I always want him or her on my team? And again, this is measuring the quality of their work, but the ability really to work well with others. And again, the same, same five point scale. Okay, important question. Is this person at risk for low performance? Simple yes or no here. And lastly, is this person ready for a promotion today? Again, yes or no. So we've got weighted in these questions, lots about their performance, and a little bit about you know internal equity when we talk about promotion and readiness to take on a promotion. These are Deloitte's four questions that form the basis of their annual true up or their performance review. So to solve the puzzle, they do continuous feedback, they do project reviews, they do check-ins, but once a year, the managers provide answers to these four questions. It's definitely something to think about, and it's definitely something that we can use for measurement to drive compensation changes and bonus. All right, so our summary of the effective performance process is that, well, first of all, we always tell our clients, don't boil the ocean, plan for the change. We need to think about how the outcome from performance will support compensation strategy. The two have to be tied together. Uh, incorporate frequent feedback. That seems to be number one, what everybody's doing. Make, that brings a, a forward-looking orientation to the reviews. You can bring more voices into the process through you know, continuous feedback with peers uh, or 360, formal 360 review. And you gotta think carefully about content and ratings and again, uh, some of those rating scales we showed you. With that in place, it would seem like we have a big check mark on our performance box. And if we're following our alignment content and our alignment strategy for today's session, the next one is the one that I think is extremely important and one we wanna we want to dive into a little bit more. Calibration. And this, to me, is actually where alignment takes place. This is extremely important. So let's, what do we mean, talk about what we mean by calibration? Very simply, I always say, calibration as it relates to performance is, do we have the correct ratings? Um, it tangibly likely means that managers get together as a group and discuss the ratings of employees that have been given as part of the performance review process, and they provide you know, fair, and they're, they're trying to discuss and provide fair and equitable ratings so that there's internal equity in the rating process, that we're rating people the same way with the same vigor and the same fairness. And how do we do this? Well, it becomes important to have a calibration meeting. Rather than one manager's discussion with HR one at a time going in and out of the, the HR office, how about all the managers in a room with the performance results in front of them across the board talking about, does this fit? So if we believe that's a, a good process to run, then there's some tips here we want to share with this. Let's talk about scheduling meetings in advance and publishing a timeline with key dates so that all managers know when the calibration meetings are taking place. Let's encourage in-person meeting versus conference calls, of course, in today's diverse organizations that are you know, global and all over, all over the world, uh, that's not always possible, but it's desired. Uh, we want to ensure that performance calibration meetings 
are held before performance review meetings with employees take place, and of course, certainly before any related compensation decisions are made. Uh, some other tips, managers should thoroughly complete the performance review process for the direct reports and be prepared to discuss the ratings and, and you know, their findings. Um, if a suggested performance distribution is going to be used, communicate the desired distribution in advance um, so that it doesn't come as a surprise during the meeting. So everybody needs to know that at the outset. And then you want to prepare for this meeting. So it's on HR now a little bit. You're going to be tasked with compiling the performance data for the business units and, and uh, of course, including average ratings and critical factors and performance distribution and identifying outliers so that, um, you know, you can sort of guide that meeting. But I think this would go a long way to helping us align performance and comp is to bring this into play. One tip we always give our clients is that nine box is a great way to facilitate discussion. You know, uh, I think um, we had a webinar done many years ago by somebody named Mark Efron who wrote a book called uh, One Page Talent Management, which was a New York Times bestseller. And, and in there, in this One Page Talent Management, uh, Mark Efron, and he had another author, I can't remember her name right now, but the, the two of them discussed the importance of nine box and that nine box was a great calibration tool and that, gee, wouldn't this be wonderful if we could, you know, start this calibration meeting with a nine box on the wall and, and you know, be able to filter on the questions that we want to ask and understand who's in what box. And it would really help us identify our true high performers, high potential, you know, the middle of the box, everybody doing a great job for us every day and on the low end, those at risk of low performance. And it would help us guide, uh, help us guide the compensation discussion that we're going to have. So then we say, well, there's some important discussions that need to take place in this calibration meeting as well. Because if we think about HR's job of working with finance to really finalize a compensation budget and plan uh, for distribution, then there's some other questions that need to be asked. And so uh, one of, some of these questions are, do we have any employees that are due for promotion? So we need to understand that when we think about compensation. Uh, are there employees who need an adjustment to maintain internal equity? So maybe they've grown in their skills and they just, you know, to be, to be fair to them for their experience that they've gained, we need to move them up because they've, they're really more experienced now. Are there employees who need a market adjustment for one reason or another? And so let's add those questions into the mix when we have these calibration sessions. The outcome from doing all of this is that you're armed with the data really to build your business case for the compensation budget for the next year and the increases that are going to be awarded. So when we think about that, we go into a discussion with finance, with the CFO, um, that's really sort of fact-based and we have, you know, all kinds of good information with us. We've had calibration sessions with managers. Um, that, you know, uh, you know, gave us outcomes on individual performance. We can bring in organizational results and metrics if that's part of your pay for performance. We'll know the company results or the business unit or division results as well. Um, if we've done some market surveys, uh, we can give the finance group and, and, and our management team a gauge of where we sit with our salary base versus market. Um, we can talk about any market or internal equity adjustments that are required. Um, we can talk about if we've done an employee engagement survey, what's coming out of that, if it's relevant. You know, for some organizations, a turnover analysis might be relevant as well. So these factors come together for us as we sort of negotiate with the CFO and with finance for those budget increases. And, you know, I think this is an important part of it because uh, it, it's, really, it's really a big question for many, for many companies. And, you know, on our side as a vendor, we don't see this part of it, right? So, so the client will say, well, this is a performance review process and, you know, hey, we've decided across the board we're going to award 3%. Or they say, you know, hey, this is a performance review process and we structure raises and bonuses based on multiple factors. So when you guys show this grid of, of compensation information to our managers, you need to include this factor and this factor and this factor so that they can make an appropriate decision and stay within the guidelines. Uh, we have other organizations, for instance, union-based organizations where, you know what, this isn't even part of the equation because for the next three years, 
uh, the raises are stipulated as part of the union contracts. They don't even get into this. But I always found this to be very interesting, and I always talk to our clients about this part of it, about how do you make the case for these budget increases. And this is some of the stuff that comes back. So we're starting to see that aligning performance and comp requires a lot of work. Like we gotta get the performance part right, we gotta do calibration, there's lots of data to collect, we gotta have discussions. There's frankly a lot of work involved in this um, to pull this together. So if we've done performance and calibration, now we can talk about um, now we can talk about the compensation and merit review process. And, and obviously here, you know, a lot of this part is going to rely on HR as well. Because um, a lot of this is just preparation, et cetera. So let's just say um, when I, you know, when I look at this, we'll talk about some factors here that, that are required. Let's start with data. So, you know, simply if we're going to prepare a compensation review process, what are some of the things we need to pull together? We're going to need a listing of, their, of our employees and their current salary. Sometimes I'm surprised when we work with our clients that bullet number one is not that easy to get to. Um, we just did one recently where uh, the client said, you know, John, we're a big organization. Uh, this was the one where we adjusted the $50 million salary base. And, and we've got three different payroll systems. Our company operates in three different countries. We've got three different payroll systems. We've got divisional HR folks running it. And, uh, you know, pulling that together is going to take us a bit of time, okay? Lump sum or off-cycle increases provided in the last year. Well, this is important as well. If we're thinking about an annual compensation review process, then boy, oh boy, we need to keep track of off-cycle increases and make sure that when a manager is making a decision about comp for somebody, they are aware of when they last increased compensation and by how much and they do want to know if somebody's been given one-time spot bonuses off cycle increases etc of course we want to know the salary market data um, you know in the form of a salary survey again for many of you out there who use comp ratio you want to make sure your midpoints are accurate for each position and that's going to help facilitate sort of the comp ratio calculation proration is also something that comes into it so when we get employees that are hired mid-year during the year, how much do they of, a, of an annual uh, increase are they actually eligible for? And those rules are again going to be different for every for every organization. And then lastly, recommendations. So some of our clients have a formal tie to performance. Formal meaning there is a calculated recommendation based on the employee's final performance review score. Uh, and, and, you know, the eligibility. So it could be, you know, if you finish that meets expectations, you're eligible for 2.5% of base salary as an increase. It may be more sophisticated. It may be, well, let's look at where you finished with performance and let's look at where you sit relative to midpoint. So we'll look at your comp ratio and then that will determine sort of a two-factor recommendation on what you should get as an increase to base salary. And of course, there's all kinds of other guidelines that go in too, but sometimes those formal ones need calculation. And in fact, at this point, I tell you, if you do formal recommendations before you launch your comp process to your managers uh, to go through it, one of the advantages of the preparation and calibration is that you will know the budgeted amounts of data, uh, the budgeted, sorry, the budgeted amounts of dollars that can be awarded. And I think that's always as well on here would be, would be something that causes confusion. So the budget and the budget pools are outcomes that are important in this slide here, not just recommendations. We should add a bullet here that says budget pools uh, as well. Uh, the other decision that needs to be made, of course, for this process is the workflow is who's involved. Is it first level, second level, managers, executive, HR? How does the process go? Um, I was talking to somebody yesterday who said they were a prospect. They route their compensation reviews from first to second level. Then it goes to HR. Then it goes to accounting. Then it goes back to HR. Then it goes to the manager. And then the manager can have a discussion with the employee. So we got to figure this out as well. Now, one of the things that we found from experience is that, and this is just an interesting piece, something to think about. The workflow for compensation is always, in, in, in our case, about 80% of our cases, it's, it's different than the workflow for performance review or performance appraisal. And what we find is that 
The folks involved in the compensation review process tend to be the higher level folks in the organization. Uh, it's, it's managers and executives where the performance review process might bring in first and second level supervisors. Um, typically, we don't see those levels involved in comp review. So just something to think about. I, I don't want to underscore the importance of this part because we need the right people involved to make the right decisions. And of course, timing. Timing's an interesting one. Timing's another consideration. And uh, timing means that, you know, when does this happen? For the vast majority of our clients, it happens after performance review. And for the vast majority of our clients, this is only a three to six week process uh, from it being started to finished. One thing that's very clear about the timing is that there's always an effective date of change for comp that we're driving towards. The end of that comp process, there is a hard goalpost, which is we need to upload the comp changes to the payroll system by this date because they become effective on this date. So uh, again, um, this is something to think very carefully about. You wanna make sure you give enough time to get through this process, right? So I'd say, again, 15 years experience, it tends to be a three to six week collaborative process for most of our clients. And of course, the end point is that data integration back to uh, the HR or payroll system. If you follow this process, one of the good things is that it's a separate process, so there's separate conversations. We know many organizations out there today are driving towards this. They want to separate the performance review discussions from the compensation review discussions. If you stand back and look at what we presented today, if you're getting into more frequent feedback, you're doing this anyways. But just by following the process of performance calibration comp, um, you are going to have a separate process. The one other thing I wanted to point out here is that for many organizations, this timing element, I'm reminded of this, I'm supposed to say this, this timing element is a real challenge because ending performance, having calibration, doing comp and squeezing that all in can be a real challenge. Some of our clients have done something pretty innovative. One of them that I work closely with is a pharmaceutical company in New Jersey. And during the review process, they do something called a quick look. And the quick look is interesting. It's just a template that goes to managers and it simply asks the manager, before the review process is finished, it asks them to weigh in on four things. Give a rating for the person's merit recommendation, low, medium, high. Give a rating for bonus, low, medium, high. Give a rating for market adjustment. Do they need one, yes or no? Are they eligible for a promotion, yes or no? And so the HR team uses this quick look to, uh, you know, to help them determine and help them negotiate with finance for the budget for compensation increases. And we're gonna, you know, we're gonna do a case study on them because I think it's a really great process and everybody can learn a lot from it. So you know, check out our website in the future and I'm sure you'll see a case study with, uh, with this client that we've worked closely with on that. Lastly, of course, the role of technology, the optional piece. Uh, as you could probably appreciate, it's gonna make your life easier. It's gonna make your life easier for managers and employees. Um, to get alignment, just to get it done and get through the process, email reminders are better, data storage is better, it's more secure, you don't have compensation data flying through emails. Uh, there's lots of good reasons to, to look at these solutions that are out there, and I believe they can really help, but I will tell you, you gotta go into technology with a vision of what you wanna do. Technology on its own won't solve your problems, you've gotta have the vision and the pieces we've talked about today in place and understood to effectively implement technology. So uh, take it from somebody who does it, uh, real important to have that vision out there. All right, I know we're, we've got to wrap up here. Um, I think we've got about five minutes left. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and just take a look through some questions and go ahead and answer them. I'm gonna apologize in advance if I don't get to all of the questions, um, but we will take a look here at some. And, um, Let's, let's go ahead and, and talk about some of these, these questions. So, all right, so there's a question here about, what about manager bias? We have managers who are friends with direct reports, and later we find out there were issues. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, that's a great question. And to me, that speaks to the role of calibration. We have to have calibration in a process to avoid relationships in the workforce. And I don't think it's uncommon for managers to have direct reports who are friends. Um, that happens in every organization. Yours is not unique. Uh, but what is extremely important is that we have a well-crafted reward strategy with formal rules around it. And to ensure that there's no bias, uh, I would absolutely insist there has to be a calibration meeting with a group that's larger than just that manager. Okay. Uh, to reduce 
bias in our reviews. We do have a blog that you can take a look at. Okay. Um, do you recommend ad hoc or off cycle promotions? If so, when and under what situation? So yes, absolutely. We recommend that the literature out there is going to tell you that those types of immediate rewards actually get the most employee engagement that doing this thing once a year um, is not, is not necessarily a process that's going to lead to engaged employees. That being said, there's lots of ideas out there that spot awards and ad hoc um, or off cycle promotions uh, as a reward when the, when the employee's eligible for it will increase engagement. So of course we recommend it, just track it. And when you do your annual process, make sure everybody's aware that during the prior year, this person got a promotion on this date and that promotion led to this compensation increase. All right, I work for a small private company where uh, there is no formal compensation process. If we were to implement a pay for performance process, what would be the ramifications for the owner and managers uh, not adhering to the guidelines? So great question, right? And then that doesn't relate to just small private organizations. We've had, you know, we've had clients that say, John, we followed the process. We did everything. We had performance review. We did the quick look. You know, we agreed as a management team what the increases would be. Then we went through the, the merit process and it came back totally different than what we all agreed to. In this case, it's all about education and getting agreement as you craft the strategy. So I think in your situation, you don't want to hand down a pay for performance process. You want to engage the managers and owners in crafting it along with you. And as you go through the process, it's important to document it. It's important to get agreement at the beginning. It's important to have the calibration session and bring it back to what you all agreed to. And it's important in that calibration session to stress, are we allowing people to go outside the rules or not? And if we are allowing them, under what scenario are we allowing them? And I think you'll get buy-in from the owner because there's obviously going to be a financial impact here. And the owner's going to know what the financials are before it goes back to managers. So if you follow that process and have that meeting, I'm sure uh, the owner's going to lay down the law about, about the dollars that are being awarded. And, um, you know, how do we get buy-in from changing uh, from sort of anniversary to focal comp reviews? You know, I think on that front, um, you know, it's just about making it easier for managers uh, to get through the process to do it once a year. Um, it's going to be easier for the HR department to compile the data. And, you know, obviously it may mean if you're moving from an anniversary to a focal model, you may have to do some, um, you know, some awards that are sort of partial awards just to bring people uh, to a fair place because there'll be some, some people as you move from anniversary to focal who might not get a compensation review for say 23 months because they land in, and they're used to getting it in February and all of a sudden now it's gonna be uh, a year at the end of December. So again, uh, they may need some, some partial amounts awarded but that's a strategy and a, and a process you can look at. So I know there's more questions out there. I apologize, I don't think we can get any farther with the questions today. Um, I'm going to turn this back over to Kathy at HR.com, and I thank everybody for joining. I hope this was useful, and uh, thanks again, Kathy. Well, thanks, John, for your webcast today. I would like to thank all of you for joining us as well. If you would like to view this webcast again, the archive recording and slides will be available for up to seven days for our free members and without restrictions for those with the certification membership. The webcast credits will show in your HR.com account within two business days. We will also send you an email with the credit information. Your feedback is important to us. Please take a moment and fill out the exit survey that opened in a new browser page on your computer. This concludes our webcast. Enjoy the rest of your day.